Hello and welcome to the Grid Talk podcast, where we'll be reviewing last week's Italian Grand Prix at Monza. Hosting today will be me, George Housen, and joining me are Louis Edwards. Hello. And Dev Tiaghi. Hi. <laughs> a, bit late, a bit late with the hi there, just like joining, but it's fine. Don't worry, you're in now. That's the main thing. Um, so, gentlemen, I think it was... I think it's fair to say that it was a very eventful race at the weekend. Um, uh, and Monza's contract was extended, extended until 2024. On the basis of this year's race, that's very good news, isn't it, Louis? Yeah, I mean, we've seen some awful races like Catalonia get their contracts extended and Germany's had theirs sort of no longer. So it's nice to have an exciting track here to stay and Mons is such an iconic track it's one that Formula One can, well it can't afford to lose at all. Mm, definitely definitely agree with that and I think the scenes after the race as well after uh, spoilers if you haven't seen the race if you haven't seen the race why are you listening to this um, but the scenes after Charles Leclerc got Ferrari's first win there since 2010 I think that alone for the fans makes it worthwhile you know having this race for another five years doesn't it Dev? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the best part about uh, Charles Leclerc's win at Monza is the fact that, you know, they were telling an interesting uh, statistic that he was working his way up through the junior karting ranks, which is when Fernando Alonso last won the race, uh, way back in 2010 in his debut season with Ferrari. Mm. Imagine uh, Leclerc was not even uh, in his teenage years. He was this kid, you know, out there uh, away from miles and miles away from the red and now um, dominating, utterly dominating. Because uh, one win at Spa would have been ruled out as a no-brainer. But here he is uh, responding back to Mercedes' uh, brilliant uh, run thus far in the ongoing season. So I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's tremendous to hear the phrase Forza Ferrari, something we all crave for as fans. And uh, here's one man solitary just fighting it out there. It's incredible. Although uh, strange uh, that he's not finding a lot of team support from the other guy in car number five. <laughs> But, um... Yeah, we will we will get on to Vettel. Um, it was it was definitely not a good weekend uh, for him. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll talk about Charles Leclerc, the guy who won the race. Um, now it's fair to say there was some, some more than questionable driving during the race, but overall that performance to win like he did ahead of Lewis Hamilton after all that pressure from him and the pressure from Bottas later on as well, it was a great performance overall, wouldn't you say, Louis? Yeah, I mean. I would say that the Mercedes were the fastest car uh, on the race day. Um, and when Vettel went out the picture, they could, they had Leclerc in the palm of his hand, in the palm of their hand, essentially. So to, to do that and defend the way he does, you know, he's so unrelenting. We saw it with his battles with Max. He, he's never going to give it up. You know, you're a Ferrari driver at Monza. You've got to wear your heart and sleeve and you've got to be prepared to defend that position until the very end. Yeah, and he absolutely did defend it. And I must admit, I think he was very lucky to get to get away with what he did at times, especially the the move where he took Hamilton off the road. But what do you what do you think, Dev? Do you think uh, Leclerc's defending was a bit over the line, literally during this? I, I I think it was, and somewhere you've got to feel for um, Hamilton as well as um, Toto Wolff. Because, uh, you know, at the end of the Grand Prix, when they confess that uh, we won't have been allowed to leave Monza minus any police uh, security in the event of Leclerc having been uh, penalized for that controversial move. So you, you've got to feel for them. But I think uh, this particular race uh, and that particular incident at the heart of it was uh, indicative of, uh, you know, a sentimental effort. So maybe you could say that the stewards were uh, far too lenient. But then, hey, there's always... Uh, the controversy marked a race at Montreal earlier this year, where uh, mm. the move that Sebastian Vettel got, he also missed, um, you know, quite a uh, part of the circuit, and he went completely wild. He went nuts, and he was reprimanded. So you could question that why wasn't Leclerc reprimanded in the same way? But uh, but that's that's racing at the end of the day. You know, one can't uh, um, you know uh, question every move. Uh, by the stewards in this one had to just stand out in Ferrari's way. There's nothing uh, doing. They mm. could say that they um, they were a bit fortunate at the end of the day. I would say. 
Yeah, I think it's fair to say that Leclerc was fortunate. And that's a good point. I never, I never realised that. I never thought about that. Probably the decision in Canada did weigh on the stewards' mind. They didn't want to, you know, make Ferrari lose another race because of another five-second yeah. penalty. But what do you think, Louis? Do you think that Leclerc should have been given a penalty? He was given the, the black and white flags, something that we don't really see in F1. And then after that, he you know, the, came. Yeah. Yeah. See, the interesting part is that, at least I don't remember you know, the last time a Grand Prix driver shown a black and white flag. No, I, no, I, I don't think that like happened. That. So I think that's a new development. None of us have actually seen that. But, yeah, uh, I didn't, I didn't even the, know it was a rule. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Genuinely, I, I thought it was just in the F1 game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I think it was a sign of maturity from Leclerc uh, in, in the aftermath of the race to admit uh, to the fact that his defending wasn't absolutely clean and spick and span, the way how he would have expected himself to be at that point. And uh, we have to respect the fact that Lewis's uh, pressure was tremendous. You know, it's like whenever mm. you see that uh, the silver arrows in your mirror, it's almost like being caught. Uh, caught up with a shark trailing you, you know, he's just sitting caught on your tails and uh, well, he enforced an error. It's as simple as that. Mm. And, um, but yeah, I think this one, uh, Ferrari were uh, given far too lenient the treatment by the stewards. Mm. There's no two ways about that. At least that's what I feel. Yeah. What do you think, Louis? A bit of home advantage yeah. by the stewards. He was definitely very fortunate. He did not, like the rule state, you have to leave the cars with. He didn't. Um, yeah, and you could see it's very obvious that Lewis was being going to be forced straight onto the grass. But then you've got to also think of, you know, the decision back in Austria not to give Verstappen a penalty for his overtaking yeah. on um, mm. on Charles. So, you know, the stewards have been a they've been a bit all over the place this season, especially with some of their decision making. Um, but I think at the end of the day. He didn't cause anything. If he, if there was real contact uh, due to him, or Lewis didn't go straight on and rejoin the way he did, and maybe Lewis was put like into the wall, then I think it would have definitely granted a penalty. But um, I think Charles could have been given. I think he was definitely given the benefit of the doubt, and I think you can see why, because the, the Italian fans would have gone. Absolutely crazy. <laughs> crazy in a bad way. They were crazy in a good way after that race. It was an unbelievable scene. Um, but yeah, let's let's just go through the order uh, very briefly, at least the podium anyway. So Charles Leclerc won the race for Ferrari. Um, Valtteri Bottas, very close second in the end. He was third for most of the race, but made a late charge. Hamilton, third in the end. He was put onto the, the soft tyres, got the fastest lap for, for that. So he... Get, he loses two points to Bottas, but it's really a drop in the ocean when it comes to his championship lead. Um, but yeah, I, I think Hamilton, I think he'd feel a bit hard done by. But at the end of the day, I don't think he'll be too disappointed leaving that race with third place, wouldn't you say, Dev? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, Hamilton did a brilliant job in catching up to um, Leclerc. And let's not forget that his, uh, um, his attacking on Leclerc was far too aggressive when compared to his teammate who all of us may have thought during the dying moments of that company would have finally overtaken Leclerc. Because let's remember that uh, uh, nowhere in the final 10 laps did uh, the gap between the race leader, that is Leclerc, and uh, the second car, which is Bottas, was under half a second. But when Lewis Hamilton was caught on the trails of Leclerc, we saw the gap uh, being reduced as less as four hundredths of a second. That was, mm. that was just tremendous. And it was that particular moment when he uh, failed to hit the apex around the, uh, the Escari chicane. I think uh, that was the most critical moment, something which we didn't see from, from Bottas. So I think in, uh, in all fairness, it's the sixth consecutive podium finish for Lewis Hamilton. So I think that's something which has to be hailed, you know. I mean, they say that Kimi is the king of Spa, but I would say that Hamilton is the emperor of Monza. Look at his past record, it speaks for himself. Great. Yeah, he's incredible. I mean, I think he won every race almost. Well, I know Mercedes won every race between 2014 and 2018. It's the first time Mercedes haven't won at Monza in the hybrid era. Yeah. Hamilton winning all but one of those races. Incredible form by him round there. Um, yeah. but let's, 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 his, uh, his, his qualifying record, you know, 2014, mm -hmm. 15, 16, 17, uh, he was uh, on the pole for four consecutive years in a run before Raikkonen came and uh, undid a bit of uh, the Mercedes advantage last year. So I think Hamilton has an absolutely incredible record at Monza. 
Yeah, definitely. He's he is the king round there. He's unstoppable almost round there. But he was stopped this time. Third place for him. They won't be too disappointed, I don't think. Um, fourth and fifth. I tell you what, if you would have bet on Renault to finish fourth and fifth in this race, you'd have been a very brave man. But you would have won. Daniel Ricciardo finishing fourth. Nico Hulkenberg, who's going to be displaced at the end of this year, fifth. Where did they find this pace from, Louis? I, I don't know. Is that like the Renault engine has been quite poor this this is definitely i would say ranks the lowest out of all the engines uh honda have made some amazing strides with red bull and toro Rosso this year um but that was a shock from nowhere renault had been kind of all over the place and lagging behind mclaren but this is this result for them you know coming away with what 22 constructors points that is a huge haul for this really tight midfield battle that we're seeing between the likes of Renault, um, Toro Rosso, McLaren. Um, yeah, it was a it was a real needed result, and I think with that big haul, it's going to put a lot of pressure on McLaren, who had let's face it, a pretty poor weekend from them. We would have expected a lot more from them. So, you know, Renault, absolutely incredible job. Yeah, fantastic job by Renault. Um, now, a guy who, did, fair to say, did not do a fantastic job at the weekend. His teammate won. He finished down in 13th. That, that really doesn't tell the full story of his race. Dev, I'm going I'm to turn to you for this one. What yeah. on earth was going through Vettel's head during this? This was rookie-like driving from a guy who's a four-time world champion. Yeah, see, I think right now, if there is one man who's really under pressure to regain a seat... I think it's Sebastian Vettel. Uh, you know, he's already become a subject of internet trolls and memes, uh, which, which is sad. <laughs> this is not the first time we've seen something like that ha- happen to a, you know, a quadruple uh, world champion. But I think that, uh, I mean, it's just, uh, is, is it desperation? Is he trying a bit too hard to outrace himself? Is he trying to lift his game? He seems to be under all sorts of pressure. And perhaps the fact that a uh, driver significantly younger, much younger to him, is taking Ferrari's charge, is attacking right from the front as the track leader, is maybe uh, it is uh, playing down Vettel's mind a bit too hardly. At least that is what it turns out to be. Because uh, it's, it's almost been a year since Vettel won. I mean, one full year since we last saw Vettel take the top step of the podium. How mm-hmm. incredible is that? We're not used to that. Okay, he spun around that uh, uh, circuit with the Americas last year. He did the same at Monza. Now again, at a track where he won his first race in, you know, well over a decade. I mean, this is this is strange. And those conditions were far more uh, difficult on the rains. And it was a dry day for racing. Uh, but then, well, as Kimi would say, and shit has to happen. So <laughs> <laughs> this happened for his former teammate. Yeah, at a time, he wouldn't have wanted that. Uh, I think it's just pressure. It's clearly pressure. Yeah, I, I've got along that as well. It is pressure, and I think it is him trying too hard. It was also Vettel trying too hard to rejoin the track, and that ended up, getting, ended up with him getting a 10-second stop-go penalty. Louis, was that deserved? It was more than deserved, I think. Um, it was reckless. I mean, you've got he, he knows, as a, just a driver, he's got so much experience. He knows that it's not far into the Grand Prix. That he's not like... 30 seconds in the lead like he was in his old Red Bull days after five laps. You know, he's not, he needs to, he really had to think, need to think better about that there will be drivers coming around and just to pull out straight into the middle of a very fast section of the track, it's, it's, it's just more than reckless. I think it's something that he's going to have to seriously think about in the future because that 10 second penalty I think it could have been more if they had a bigger maximum penalty mm. yeah and he, of course he, yeah so he rejoined uh, Ascari very very dangerously took out Lance Stroll and then Lance Stroll did what Lance Stroll does and rejoined dangerously himself he literally said on the radio I don't know if you guys have seen the best radio broadcast but they, they've edited it so it's literally like what the fuck is this guy doing while uh, Stroll does the exact same thing as what Vettel did, and that landed Stroll with a with a drive through penalty. Ah, nearly took out Gasly. Calamitous driving from the pair of them, wasn't it, Dev? Yeah, may have been blasted out uh, that night by Lance Stroll uh, Senior, Mr. Stroll. But yeah, uh, well, uh, seriously, 
that was that was terrible because uh, you know you you see an experienced driver commit uh, an erroneous move like that and you want to learn as a youngster and then what you do you end up replicating the same thing so <laughs> compromised both the drivers races but you know i would just add one thing that it uh, for surely uh, for sebastian vettel the race was uh, completely bonkers right inside the opening lap seconds from the start because he was overtaken by halkenberg uh, mm. speaking of reno space which we were talking about earlier it wasn't that Perez's race was going completely down the drain because he reclaimed the lost uh, position. You know, he was back on fourth. He had passed Renault, and then he commits this mistake, and then he becomes a backmarker in the next few seconds. So mm. the changing vagaries of Grand Prix can be so sudden. But I think now, uh, what do you think? What's going to happen? Because we don't have too many Grand Prix remaining ahead of us. Um, as he rejoins the grid and takes his position at Singapore. I wonder whether he would be reminded of the events that took place in 2017, when uh, both the Ferraris was uh, was seen sandwiching oh, yeah, Max Verstappen. Yeah. I hope something like that doesn't happen from Vettel, because he's somebody who's way better than what uh, we've seen him of late. Yeah, Singapore being the next race and Vettel uh, doing very very well around there in the past. But we will preview that next week. For this is about Italy, so continue running down the grid. Sixth in the end was Alexander Albon of Red Bull. I'd say that's a fairly decent driver of what happened, but it perhaps could have been more because he was pushed off by Carlos Sainz in the opening laps. What, how did you read that, Louis? Was that Albon being too ambitious or was that Sainz getting his elbows out a bit too much? I think Sainz has a, a right to get his elbows out. You know, he, he's in the McLaren, which of course is, at the moment it's an inferior car to the, to the Red Bull. You know, he's going to fight for every position he can get. Um, I mean, Albon had only just Attempted an overtake on Sainz the corner before he got back. He was going to be, he's going to absolutely keep the position. He had the inside line. I think it was very much his corner. Um, the Lesmos are very quick right handers. You know, car on the inside is obviously going to come out better. So I think it was a bit over ambitious from Albon. I think if he just bided his time, he would have probably just got DRS on the straight and was, would have been able to uh, overtake him into Ascari. I think, I think he's. He's trying to please this sort of this new Red Bull team. He's really trying to show what we can do. I mean, we saw what he did at Belgium. It was in some brilliant, brilliant racing at Belgium. And I think he's just just needs to calm it down a bit and just race smart rather than race hard. Mm. Yeah, and that's fair enough. But he is doing better than what Pierre Gasly did in the same car. So it's 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 not it's not all bad for Albon. I think that's a fairly decent race for him. Uh, but both Red Bulls were in the wars this year. This time, Max Verstappen starting at the back at his engine penalty um, and being, in, for once, incredibly cautious into the first corner. But it didn't pay off, did it, Dev? Yeah, it didn't. It didn't. Uh, it reminded us of the last year's incident with Valtteri Bottas, which was somewhere in the middle of the race. He was pushed mm. over to the grass and then he avoided uh, that, uh, that huge turn around the, the chicane. And then he just went over zigzagging, finding his way through. But I think that, you know, uh, on the point of um, Alex Albon, I think the best part about that guy is that he's always ready for a good fight. Perhaps it's these attacking instincts which make him the ideal teammate for Max Verstappen. Because if you want to prove uh, uh, yourself to be the antithesis to um, Verstappen, you cannot just do it by being um, a sitting duck, by being too cautious. You've got to be aggressive. But I add, uh, but I think I, I completely second Louis' um, uh, thought that you've got to be uh, watchful. So it's going to be a a balance of cautious cautiousness and, and, and aggression at the end of the day. But I think still um, a pretty fine drive uh, from Alex Albon at Monza. Yeah, it was a good drive from Albon. I think in the end, a good drive by Verstappen as well. I mean, he was miles off the lead. He had to have his front wing changed. He was, you know, he was nowhere really. And to claw it back to eighth around a track where Red Bull shouldn't do very well, not bad in the end, wouldn't you say, Louis? Yeah, I mean... Um... We don't, we don't expect much from this Honda engine, but they were doing incredibly well on what is their Red Bull car have always sort of set up for that sort of Monaco S sort of downforce, and they do incredibly well. But you know, Max fights hard. He's, I would say personally, I think he is the the fastest driver on the track we've seen during this European season. That he has excelled um, what <laughs> the expectations of that Red Bull Honda. Um, but I think, you know, he had, he had issues and, you know, I think he dealt with them very well. Um, I believe he had like a limiter issue. So when he was, um, 
having his battle with Sergio Perez, um, he was struggling because he just didn't have that extra top speed from his engine that he that he needed to get past. But I still think it was an impressive race to come from the back and you know make his way up like that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you mentioned Sergio Perez there. Perez, you know, he went, I think it was something like seven or eight races without scoring any points. He scored another decent hole for Racing Point in Italy. Seventh place, six points. Decent day for the Mexican, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, uh, it was It was good uh, from Perez. Although I would say that this season hasn't, hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, really done You know, he somehow, uh, he's one of those guys who you, who you don't really expect to frequent the podium, but then Bring him to those uh, uh, fast-paced circuits like uh, Baku, and you suddenly find the guy on the podium. But I think uh, his car isn't is. I mean, in a way, you could say that he completely has to, still has to extract the best from his car. You can you can seriously feel that he's sandbagging a bit. I would say that's from where, where I see Perez's season so far. I mean, um, how many times has he been able to break into top five? You know, there was almost a chance for significantly slower cars on, on the streets, such as Alfa Romeo. Uh, for example, Raikkonen at Germany, he was running well into the points before, you know, he was, uh, I think he's skated went out of the track. So I think if you compare the car that Perez has at his disposal, this would be the Alfa Romeo. I would say that he has the advantage of driving a slightly better machine. But maybe in the coming races, we would see something fantastic from him. But it, it's been it's been a decent year so far from there. There's nothing too exciting, I would say. It's been slightly lame. It's been it's been lukewarm. Yeah. Yeah, this it's been pretty average for him really, hasn't it? The car's not really there. He's not been at his best either, I don't think. But he's there until twenty twenty two, I think. So he's got a long contract to see out. Um now another guy that didn't score has not scored much at all this season really, Antonio Giovinazzi, in his home race, the first Italian to race in his home race since about two thousand and twelve, I think. You know, truly. Um, he got two points for Alfa Romeo. Solid day, wouldn't you say, Louis? Yeah, I mean, um, we've been used to seeing Kimi pull out some amazing performances in that Alfa, and it's nice to see that um, Giovinazzi can you know, show what he's worth to the Alfa Romeo team. Um, he's not had many opportunities to shine, and so to shine at your home, home race, it can't be any better. You can't have a better feeling than that. Than that. Yeah, definitely. What do you think, Dev? Do you think that, I mean, he didn't score for ages, uh, Giovinazzi, but he's got, a, you know, he's been doing better recently. Although, you know, Belgium, he should have scored points. No. Do, you think he, do you think he'll be there at Alfa Romeo next year? I think he, if there is a guy who certainly deserves to reserve his seat for the next year, then it's this man, Antonio Giovinazzi. I think hats off for his Sterling drive at Monza. I think perhaps it also makes up for one of the most underestimated uh, performances throughout the season. Because at a time where much of the attention rests with uh, the Iceman, here's a young man, you know, in his first rookie season, and he scores uh, his career best performance, wasn't it? P9 at Monza. Yeah. I think he really deserves a lot of credit because uh, it was a disappointing race from Reitman's standards. I mean, uh, but then um, he kept the Italian flag uh, high. And as you rightly said, the, perhaps the most exciting uh, Italian talent since uh, with Antonio Liuzzi and the other guys. I think uh, Giovinazzi certainly deserves to be up there. And I think the best is yet to come, for sure. He's capable of doing much better. Mm. Yeah, another guy who's capable of better results as well is uh, Lando Norris, 10th in the end. I guess not a disaster for McLaren. They scored points. He was helped by, out by retirements, unfortunately, one of them being his own teammate. But it's just, it's just kind of a, you know, they got points at least. You know, it wasn't too bad in that in that respect. But... Still to be that far off, I mean, Renault were very impressive, but to be that far off Renault around Monza, McLaren are going to be leaving very disappointed, won't they, Louis? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, Lando had a real time of it, you know, having to start from the back and work his way up to 10th. And Carlos was so unfortunate to not have his wheel put on. I mean, that could have been better points all, but yeah, it is slightly worrying because we've seen, we've been seeing that McLaren have consistently throughout the season just scored just that bit ahead of Renault and that's how they've managed to sort of get their fourth place in the constructors. But I think they would have come to this track after having such a great, uh, well, 
on Norris's side, almost having a great weekend and a great fifth place finish. Um, I think we would have expected to see more of that um, coming into another low, a low downforce track, but it just wasn't meant to be. I don't think. I mean, kudos to Lando for getting up to tenth from like seventeenth, eighteenth where he started, but McLaren will not be fully over the moon with their uh, performance. No, definitely a bad weekend for McLaren. Um... Well, at least they scored points. Tar Rosso, I guess you wouldn't expect them to score points around here, but they missed out just about. Uh, Kvyat was running pretty well, though. I think Kvyat was running in the points, but he retired with a mechanical failure. Gasly in P11. And what, what, do you, what do you make to Gasly since he's come back to uh, Tar Rosso, Dave? I think, if anything, he's probably been better than what he was at Red Bull in terms of his own personal performance. Yeah, I think you could say that sometimes a few drivers out there need a reality check. And maybe it was a strong wake-up call for uh, Pierre Gasly. He had a few interesting moments uh, with the Alfa Romeo of Antonio Giovinazzi, and he was fighting well with the Haas of Magnussen. Probably not the fastest car out there, but uh, I think we could really look forward to a great uh, uh, battle from uh, Gasly for the remainder of the season. I think uh, he seems uh, now charged, focused. And uh, you could also say that a lot of weight over his shoulders has been taken off because he was partnering Max Verstappen, who's, uh, who's a fantastic driver. But then again, the kind of uh, energy that he brings, he, his, his own scintillating form and his consistency can really um, cause a lot of uh, worry for his teammate. Now that Gasly is back at Toro Rosso, it seems that he's, he's, he's enjoying this, this sense of freedom. I think the responsibility is there, but at the same time, he has this, this freedom to go out there and express himself. And uh, Monza was maybe just, just a great start, and uh, who knows, the best could lie in, in front of him, you know, in the rest of the races. Yeah, and with uh, Singapore and Japan up soon as well, Toros should do pretty decently around there, I think. Um, now, 14, for a guy that, unfortunately, is the only person who's not scored any points this season, but he's putting, in, I think, some fantastic performances. George Russell, only one place behind a Ferrari at the end. Um, I mean, if Williams aren't going to score any, well, they have scored one point with uh, Kubica, but if Russell isn't going to score any points this season, I think it's, you know, it's pretty likely now because if you're going to do it anywhere, it would have been Monza. It's, uh, yeah. What, what, do you, what do you think, Louis? It's, um, I guess they were just kind of there, but did you see some of the battles between Russell and Kubica? They were really going at it, weren't they? Yeah, we, we've seen that a lot this se- season. They, I, when they're sort of like seeing the battles, and it threw me back to France when they were having their little scraps. And it's like, well, they've got to keep themselves entertained somehow <laughs> when they're so far back. Um, but, you know, they, yeah, Williams have this great sort of engine package with Mercedes, but they have so much drag on that car mm-hmm. that, that it's disappointing that they're not making up any more places. Um, you know, Russell is an absolute phenomenal driver. We saw it in Formula 2 last season, the performances that he can pull up. You know, we've seen it um, at points this season. Hungary it was a brilliant performance. Um, it's a shame that it's Russell who's the one <laughs> without a point. Yeah. Because he has been uh, better than Kibitza this season. And, um, well, you just got to hope for a bit of good fortune another race, maybe it rains in Singapore again, <laughs> you can see some more carnage. Yeah, I think we need a lot of good luck to be honest with you, to score points. Um, but I think a guy who had a lot of bad luck this weekend, and Dev, I'm sure you've been waiting for this one, Kimi Raikkonen, 15th in his Alfa Romeo. What an absolutely awful race it was for him. Yeah, uh, I mean, if, if Kimi would be here, he would just simply say, I was having this shit, you know, because uh, it's just... Uh, <laughs> Forget- <laughs> forgettable race for the Iceman. I mean, it, it's so sad that just uh, in the red overalls last year, just to the clocks, he turns out in the one one minute nineteen point one one nine. And this year, uh, I mean, what did his team do to him? I mean, how could they put on the wrong set of tires? I mean, uh, there was a lot of confusion surrounding mm. in the beginning. You know, that uh, I think it was Trofty who was talking to Mr. Martin Bundle. He said that. Maybe his team didn't understand the rules that despite the fact that your driver is starting from the pit lane, it doesn't mean that you do not put on the same set of tires as you used during the qualifying. So I think that compromised a lot, compromised a lot for him. But then you can't, 
you cannot not blame Kimi Raikkonen for spinning out, uh, losing control, and spiraling out of control at Parabolica. I mean, this is a track which where he's done significantly well in the past. You know, mm-hmm. uh, he brought us so much of joy, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, his uh, his error uh, left us with a dramatic uh, qualifying. Probably Charles Leclerc is thanking him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Something you can say. Hmm. Yeah. It was good news for Charles. Yeah. Yeah, fitting the wrong tyres and getting him a ten-second stop go yeah. penalty, just like his good friend Sebastian Vettel. Yeah. But we, we, we're gonna we're gonna have to talk about the qualifying as well. For those who didn't see, just watch the race and didn't watch qualifying, go back and watch the qualifying Q3 YouTube highlights. It's free; anybody can access it. I have never seen anything like this. Not even in an F1 online lobby in the game, you get this kind of madness. Everybody was trying to get the toe, the slipstream, which is always the aim around Monza, so you get the slingshot. But nobody wants to be first. So everybody, except for Carlos Sainz and Charles Leclerc, missed the line. Absolutely farcical scenes, wasn't it, Louis? I mean, it was absolutely... Uh, when they were all coming out of the pit lane, I was like, this is going to just be horrendous because you know even though the FI had set like a minimum lap time so they would like get round it's like they still just seem to be just in a big huddle just going around the track it was more like a parade than it was a qualifying session because um I mean it was a bit cheeky from Charles Leclerc you know he he was meant to be giving Sebastian the toe and he just is just not quite you know going quick enough um so he did guarantee himself pole there. Um, you know, Lewis Hamilton was absolutely fuming over the radio uh, about what the Ferraris were doing. And I think in the end, just Carlos Sainz just went, stop this, I'm just going to go. Because <laughs> yeah. he may as well at that point. Yeah, and it worked out for him. He, he ended up setting a lap. Unfortunately for him, he didn't get him any higher up the grid because of it. But... I've got a touch on qualifying as well because, again, more dubious calls in the favour of Ferrari, potentially. Vettel appeared to go off the track at Parabolica when he set his lap. I mean, it didn't make a difference in the end because he was well down the order anyway in the race. But what, what did you see that, Dev? Did you, did you think that Vettel should have been disallowed? I, I, I think I missed that part uh, that you're talking about with Sebastian right. Vettel in it. But I, I, I do have to add that the last time I, 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 I uh, once saw Lewis Hamilton so curious, was in the 2018 Silverstone race when he labeled uh, interesting tactics the move uh, from Raikkonen, uh, which was clearly a racing incident. He took mm. him out in, in the opening uh, in the opening lap itself, and he spun around, and then what we saw later on was a sterling drive for recovery. But uh, yeah, there was dramatic scenes, as you rightly put it. Uh, who would have thought that? Uh, I think what was interesting from a fan perspective is that the Mercedes were nearly up there with Ferrari's straight line speed, weren't they? They didn't really do a bad job, and throughout the race there were there were critical moments where it was well now and ever it was like Hamilton was all over Leclerc. So I think we saw uh, what was to transpire in the Grand Prix. We saw it in the trailer in the qualifying. So I think that was that was a pretty interesting battle for straight line speed between the two top teams. Yeah, it was encouraging for Mercedes in that sense because this everybody was expecting Ferrari to win this, and they did. But it was close. Mercedes were arguably faster during the race, so it Actually, it's ominous, if anything, for the rest of the season. If they're this close, even at a power track. Right. So, um, so yeah, I'll just go through the rest of the order. Roman Grosjean, sixteenth. Eastman Ascari was never in it. Has still looking woeful. At least he finished the race, though. Kevin Magnussen out of the race, forty-three laps. He did. Kvyat was out as well. Signs out, and Robert Kubica, as usual, last. Two laps down, nobody near him. I don't know what, I don't know. He was right with Russell in the early stages, but obviously he tapered off towards the end. Um, yeah, let's go through the championship as well. Let's go through this. So, Lewis Hamilton still leads, obviously, uh, 63 points ahead of Valtteri Bottas. Uh, good weekend for Hamilton because he gained massively on uh, Verstappen, who remains in third. But Charles Leclerc, he's up to four. Three points back uh, for Verstappen. Very close. Uh, what we can say, I think didn't uh, Leclerc pass Sebastian Vettel in the driver's standings? Yeah, he has. Yes, he's yeah. Been, Thirteen yeah. points ahead Third. of Vettel now. He's fourth. He's fourth. He's behind Verstappen. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Sad for Vettel. See, I mean, uh, 
another uh, pool race, and where do we see Vettel? He's uh, being challenged by his teammate. He's now fifth. So last year, he was only when it was coming close to him. Yeah, so I, think, I think the main excuse for Vettel before... I'm sorry, go on. Yeah, I think the main excuse for Vettel before was that, you know, at least he was higher than his teammate in the championship, but he doesn't even have that now. No. <laughs> He's being well and truly pasted, unfortunately. It's Sebastian mm-hmm. New Kimmy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Right, uh, Pierre Gazza, despite his emotion, he remains in safe. Carlos signs seven. Danny Ricardo, he's up to eight. Level on points with Alex Albon. And Daniel Kvyat is still in 10th, thanks to his podium in Hockenheim. Uh, Mercedes, of course, still well on top. Miles ahead of Ferrari, despite Ferrari's win. They still have scored the Scuderia this weekend. They're ahead by a whopping 154 points as we go into Singapore. That's where he shakes his head. <laughs> uh, Red Bull, they're on 266. Ferrari, 351. McLaren's still best of the rest despite their bad weekend, but Renault close up. They are just 18 points behind. Singapore's going to be a very important race for both of them. Uh, Toro Rosso, they're demoted down to sixth. Racing point, they stay seventh. Alfa Romeo, eighth. Haas, ninth. And, of course, Williams, tenth. Oh, man, that sounds brief. Um, I think we should also give a mention. I don't know if you guys saw the, um, the crash in Formula Three as well uh, with Perot. That was, yeah. yeah, that was. was that, did he did he hit the, the sausage curbs? Was it yes, the sausage curbs? Did yeah. He, yeah. Why there was a sausage I mean, curb there? I don't know though. You, like if you run off the track there, you're going flat out to try and recover, and he just got launched. Like <laughs> I couldn't yeah. believe it. And he's a very lucky boy. He mo- he walks away from it. Thank God. If there wasn't a halo there, though, in his car, I think we could have had, a, had another fatality, genuinely. I don't know yeah. what you guys think. Yes. And you, and you can't help but feel for uh, Antoine, uh, who we lost recently, because uh, if you actually compare it, one day not safe, but you know, this crash appeared far more uh, fatality causing, you know, than uh, the one that we saw at Spa. But thankfully, no damage was done, and luckily the guy was back on back on his feet, and he was being escorted away safely. But then your 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 point is absolutely valid. Why do we have sausage curbs? They really sp- uh, send the car into a dizzy. He was suspended from the ground, and you know, don't you don't want to see a top rank driver somersaulting to thin air, not knowing where he will end up. Mm-hmm. I think that's a very very scary predicament for drivers out there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, thank God they at least removed it before um, F1 qualifying because obviously if, they, if that didn't happen for him, he didn't have his incident, then if that happens to an F1 car, it would be even worse because the speed they take, obviously. Um, I think it's also right we should give an update on Juan, Mel, Juan Manuel Correa, if I can say it correctly, the other guy that was involved in the crash with Hubert. Um, his family released a statement on, I think it was Saturday, um, or Friday actually, Uh, They say, as time has progressed, new complications have surfaced as a consequence of the massive impact he suffered in Saturday in Belgium. On his arrival to London, Juan Manuel was diagnosed with acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is an injury considered common in high-speed accidents such as this one. Unfortunately, this injury has resulted in Juan Manuel falling into acute respiratory failure. Juan Manuel is currently in intensive care that specializes with respiratory injuries. At this point of time, he is in an induced state of unconsciousness, i.e. an induced coma, um, and under ECMO support. He's in a critical but stable condition. I've heard from a few people about this. I don't want to speculate. I don't want to. I think it's wrong to, but I do fear for this guy. I really do. I think... At this point, if he escapes out of this with his life, I think he can consider himself a very lucky boy, and we wish him all the best. You know, and for some prayers with his fam- friends and family as well. Everybody at F1 Chronicle, I'm sure, is thinking about him at this time. Um, bright talent. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty much everything. Everything. Sorry, it's not end on a song, but I hope that. But, um, but yeah, thank you, Louis for, and uh, Dev for joining us. No problem. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah. Fantastic having you both on. And we will be back next week to preview the Singapore Grand Prix. And who knows, maybe a Red Bull win. Who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it. But yeah, until, until then, see you then. Just keep, keep posting the F1 Chronicle as well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luke. Bye.